Welcome to Seeds of the Word. Today's session, Do Not Worry. Let's turn to Luke chapter 12, 22 to 34. Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, just a side note here, the I here is Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. The Gospel of John calls him the Word of God. And John chapter 1 verse 3 says, Nothing was made without him. All things were made through him. There was nothing that was made without him. Here is the author of life itself. Here is the author of life itself. And these are important tips, important ways of living, important things to keep in mind as we live our Christian life from the author of life itself. So let's see what he says. Do not worry. The word worry, again, a Greek word which says merimnao, which basically means to be pulled apart, to be broken into pieces, to be pulled apart in different directions, like the same force that is that is worked up on our mind when we are anxious. We get pulled apart. We get broken into pieces. And I'm sure many of us have felt the same thing. Confused, scared, worried. Broken to pieces. That's what it means to worry. It's being broken to pieces because of anxiety. And he says, the first thing he says, do not worry about your life. Again, if you look behind the English, the Greek says, psuk, which basically means soul. Psuke, which basically means soul. That's the same word from which we get the word psychology, psychiatry psychotic that's the same word it means soul your ego your personality your feelings your emotions everything that says i want i feel i wo- i will that's your soul and he says do not worry about your soul do not worry about the wants and appetites of your soul do not worry about the the, the desires of your soul do not worry about your soul He further says, what you will eat. And my dear brothers and sisters, Christians all across the world, in today's world, are so concerned about eating. They're so concerned about eating. All of us tend to get so concerned about what we're going to eat. We either on one extreme about being overly conscious about our diet or we are overly conscious about our appetites either ways we're just focusing and our whole worries about what we're going to eat think about it further not about the, not about the body what you will put on i don't think i need to elaborate about this the kind of clothes that we want to wear the kind of things that we want to put on. We're so concerned about all of these things. We're so concerned about our clothes. We're so concerned about our dress. We're so concerned about our shirts. We're so concerned about about everything that we're going to wear, our shoes, our accessories, about fashion, about style. There's such a lot of effort. There's such a lot of energy. There's such a lot of mental energy that is exhausted about what you're going to wear and what you're going to eat. And Jesus says, don't worry, because that worry is breaking you into pieces. Don't worry. And it's interesting what he says. He says, don't worry about your life, what you will eat. And then he says, don't worry about the body, what you will put on. Jesus, very interestingly, relates the soul to eating, and the body to clothing. He says, your soul has appetites within it. Your soul has desires and tastes and wants within it. And your soul wants this and wants that. 
and desires this food and desires that food and says, you know what, listen, don't worry about your soul, about what you will eat. You see, when we are worried about eating, that, that worry, that anxiety, that desire comes from our soul. And as far as clothing, it's the flesh, the body. Further, he says in verse 23, life is more than food and body is more than clothing. Think about it. Your life. Again, the Greek word is psuche, which means soul. Your soul is more than food. When you're so concerned about the appetites of your stomach, when you're so concerned about the appetites of your of your of your taste buds. You're following the appetites and the desires of your soul. And Jesus is trying to tell you, listen, my dear brother, my dear sister, listen, my dear child, there is more to your soul than food. There is an eternity that's at stake. Further, he says, the body is more than clothing. There is more to your body than just clothing. Because this body is corruptible and this body is going to die and this body is going to be corrupted and this body is going to decompose. But there is a more glorious body that you are going to get when you are raised up from the dead if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ on the last day when this whole world is going to come to an end. Your body is going to be raised up. You are going to receive a resurrected body, a glorious body with no concerns about clothing. You see, our soul is more than food and our body is more than just clothing. There's more to life than the worries about food and clothing. There's more to life than the anxieties of food and clothing. There's more to life than the the concerns about what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear. We're so so engrossed. We're so lost in our striving for good food. We are so lost and engrossed in our striving for good clothes that we've forgotten that the desires for food and clothing come from our soulish self, from our old nature, from the appetites of our flesh. And our soul is more than just the food and the clothing. Our body is more than just the food and the clothing. There's eternal life that's at stake. There's everlasting life that's at stake. There's life that's at stake itself. If we are going to spend our whole life concerned about our food and our clothing, we have missed the point, my dear brothers and sisters. We can call ourselves Christians. We can say we are a good Christian. We can say that we ha- we, we say we have a time of prayer. We can say that we have a time of family prayer. We can say all that we want. But if you are concerned about food and clothing, you have missed the point. Your soul is at stake. That energy, that, that, that time, that effort that you've put in worrying about the appetites of your soul, put it into the kingdom of God. That energy, that time, that effort, that work that you've put in, worrying about the clothing that you will wear, put it into the kingdom of God because there's more to life than all of this. Let's go further. Verse 24. Jesus says, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? So the first comparison Jesus makes with is the ravens. You see, they search and they find their food. The Lord provides for them. It's not like the ravens just sit in a nest and and are just waiting for the food to drop from heaven. No, 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 no. They go around, they search for their food, but when they search, they find. The Lord provides. There's no stress about it. There's no anxiety about it. There's no sowing about it. There's no reaping about it. There's no harvesting. There's no stress and anxiety about anything else. There's no stress and anxiety about the pensions and the investments that they have to make. There's no stress and anxiety about how they have to save tax. 
There's no there's no anxiety and tensions about about what investments they need to make to save their money that they don't have to pay tax. There's no stress and tension about the properties and the possessions that they have. They're just there. They need to sow. They need to reap. They need to have storehouses. They need to have barns. But God feeds them. And then the question Jesus asks each one of us, how much more valuable are you than the ravens? Don't you realize, my dear brother, my dear sister, Jesus Christ died for you. He shed his precious blood for you. It's not a simple love. It's not just an affection he has towards you. He loves you with all his heart, with all his mind, that he left his heavenly glory behind, came down as a human being, and although he could avoid the crucifixion, he took it upon himself that he could bear the punishment for your sin. That's how much he loves you. Many people say, I know this particular person, maybe a celebrity or a politician. I know that particular person. And they, cry, and they, try, to, they, they try to get their work done based on this influence that they have. Maybe they're related to a particular politician or they're related to a particular celebrity and they have this influence and they, they go to the government offices, they go here, they go there and they get their work done. We have the influence of the king of kings here. We have the support of the Lord of Lords, the Lord God Almighty. There's nothing that we need to worry about. There's nothing that we need to be concerned about. When you search, you will find it. Don't you understand? Our God loves you. The next comparison that he makes is in verse 25. He says, and which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? One cubit. You see, when you look at a child growing, a question that we can ask ourselves, how much does that child have to work to make sure that he grows in height? Look at ourselves. How much do we need to make sure that we grow and advance in age? There's nothing, right? There's nothing you and I can do about it. No matter what your diet, you're still going to grow. You're still going to advance in age. If you're a kid, you're going to grow up in height. You're going to put on weight. You're going to grow. There's hardly any work or effort that you need to put from your end to grow. And that's what the Lord is saying. If you cannot do anything about adding height or weight to your stature, to your, to your body, then why are you anxious? That's what he says in verse 26. If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? You see, this is such a simple thing. It's just one little inch. One little inch. Can you add one little inch to your height? Can you do that? No. God makes us grow. The spirit that we have within us, the breath of life that God gives us, makes us grow. There's no work at all. And if you cannot do any work, any effort, so as to increase your height or your weight, so as to increase the height that you have, so as to make yourself advance in age in any way. If you cannot add one hour, as some translations say, if you cannot add one hour to your life, such a simple thing, you cannot do it, and yet you are concerned about the food and the clothing in your life. Let's go a little further. Verse 27. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. You see, lilies are still a step further as compared to the height of a child or, or the ravens in the field. The ravens still have to search and find, and the Lord provides for them the food. But you see, the lilies don't make 
any effort to look beautiful. God clothes them. They don't have to make any effort to look beautiful. God clothes them. And what does he say? In verse 28, if then God so clothes the grass, the grass, my dear brothers and sisters, look at the beautiful meadows that are there, the beautiful green lawns. God clothes that grass, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the oven. How much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Why does he call us of little faith? Because we've got such a lot of stress and anxiety about working towards the food. We cannot even grow with our own work. We've got such a lot of stress and anxiety about working towards looking beautiful. When God can do the same, all we need to do is do what he tells us to do. This is a point that we need to check in our lives, my dear brother, my dear sister. In your life, do you have anxieties about how you look? What you need to wear, what you need to eat. When you cannot do any of these things, if you have any of these things, if you have anxieties about any of these things, you know that you've got little faith. And that's why Jesus says, Oh, you of little faith. Why little faith? Because there's such a lot of stress and anxiety about working towards food when you cannot even grow using your own effort. There's such a lot of stress and anxiety about working towards looking beautiful when God can just do the same to the lilies and the grass of the field. And then he says in verse 29, And do not, do not seek about what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. It's not just about eating and drinking here. He goes further and says, Do not have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after and your father knows that you need these things. My dear brother, my dear sister, the nations of the world stands for the Gentiles, the non-believers. All the non-believers are concerned about these things but we believe in Christ. As Christians we believe in Christ. But we are still so anxious about what we are going to eat. We are still so anxious about what we are going to wear. We are still so anxious about our education. We are still so anxious about our career. We are still so anxious about how much income we are going to get. We are still so anxious about the money that we are going to get. And ultimately we need the money and we are anxious about the money because we are anxious about what we are going to eat and what we are going to wear. And it all comes down to the appetites of your flesh and the appetites of your soul. To feed yourself and to make yourself look beautiful with the clothes that you wear, you need money. And so you start getting anxious about the money. And so you start getting anxious about how you need to work towards the money. And then it's considered a noble cause if you're very concerned about your education. But the Lord is saying, listen, have you seen the lilies of the field? I clothe them. Have you seen the ravens? I feed them. Your effort... Your work is going to do nothing for you. Trust in me. I feed you. I clothe you. I will give you. Turn to me. I will provide. Your father knows you. Your father knows that you need food. Your father knows that you need clothes. And your father will provide for you. Turn to him, my dear brothers and sisters. Don't have an anxious mind about these things. Throw out the anxiety. Don't go under the yoke of Satan. Don't go under the slavery of Satan's anxiety and anxious thoughts and temptations to be anxious and fearful. The Lord your God is your father and he will provide for you. He will give you. He loves you. And then in verse 31, seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. The word seek is actually the same as seeking by inquiring, like an investigation, getting to the bottom of the matter. Like an investigative journalist would get into the bottom of a news item. And the kingdom is a Greek word basileia, 
which basically means realm in which a king sovereignly rules. The sovereignty of a king, the government of a king. And he says, seek the government of God. Seek by inquiring, investigating, diligently seeking that realm, that domain in which God sovereignly rules. And all these things shall be given to you because when you are in the kingdom of God, everything is there for you. When you are in the kingdom of God, you are not under the curse of poverty. When you are in the kingdom of God, the Lord provides you in abundance. Because he is the same Lord who says, I come to give life and life in all its abundance. My dear brothers and sisters, we've got to seek the kingdom. We've got to search for the kingdom. We've got to investigate, inquire, diligently seek that realm in which God rules. And put our mind and our affections upon heavenly things, upon the Lord. And all these things shall be given to us. Let's go further. He says, verse 32. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He says, do not fear, little flock. I'm assuming he means a flock of sheep. Because in John chapter 10, he calls us his sheep. And he says, my sheep know my voice. I know them and they follow me. They hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And he says, do not fear, my dear little sheep. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Remember, we need to be his sheep. If we are his sheep, then he says, do not be afraid. If we listen to his wife, if he knows us, if we seek, in, seek him in everything that we are doing, then he says, do not be afraid. He says, do not fear little flock. Do not fear my sheep. Only those who are my sheep have the right not to be afraid. Only those who are my sheep have the right not to be anxious. Who has the right not to be afraid? Who is told that the Father knows their needs? Who is told to seek the kingdom and all these things shall be given? The food, the clothing, the wealth will be added. Who is told these things? The sheep, the flock of God. Unless you are the flock of God, unless you're part of the flock of God, you cannot be without anxiety. So you want to get rid of anxiety in your life? Check, are you a sheep? Because if you are a sheep, you are justified in not being anxious and worried and afraid about anything. If you are not his sheep, you better be worried about everything. Because there is no hope. So the only person who's, who's got the right to accept this exhortation is a sheep. And that's what the Lord says. Do not fear, little flock. Who has the right not to be afraid? The sheep. Who is told that the Father, the Father knows what you need and that the Father will provide? The sheep. Who is told to seek the kingdom of God and then these things will be added. People have taken this, this statement that Jesus makes and, and, and dragged it and skewed its meaning completely. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. To whom is he telling this? To the sheep. You first have to be a sheep. You can't just seek the kingdom of God and assume everything will be given to you. No, you've got to be a sheep first. You have to be listening to the voice of God. You have to be listening to the voice of your shepherd. And once you keep listening to the voice of your shepherd and you follow him like a sheep follows a shepherd, then you are already seeking the kingdom of God and then all these things shall be added unto you. And that's why he says to the sheep, it is the father's good, pleasure 
the father is pleased the father delights in you the father is delighted and pleased and joyful to give you what the kingdom of god so what must we do what must we do and that's what we get in verse 33 and 34 jesus tells us what to do and the first step towards doing something so that we can rectify our life and stop being anxious is not very nice he says sell what you have sell what you have and give alms provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old a treasure in the heavens that does not fall, fail where no thief approaches nor moth destroys sell what you have sell your possessions why because in doing so you're going to provide yourselves purses money purses that do not grow old because the money purses that you will provide for yourselves will be heavenly money purses a heavenly account a heavenly investment when no thief can ap- approach it and destroy it and no moth can decay it no moth can contaminate it no moth can destroy it sell and give arms it's a very plain statement there's nothing more to it sell what you have and give arms to the poor and then verse 34 says for where your treasure is there your heart will also be you see it's all about the treasure where is the storehouse of your treasure there is your heart my dear brothers and sisters i'll turn this question around where's your heart what's the focus of all the passion and the energy and emotion and strength that you have that's your treasure and if it is not the kingdom of god you've got it all wrong where's your heart where's the focus of your heart where's the focus of all your passion all your power all your energy all your emotion all your strength all your wisdom and intelligence what is it focused on is it focused on the kingdom of god that's where it should be if it's not on that then your heart's in the wrong place and your heart's in the wrong place because your treasures in the wrong place your treasures in the world but you see as jesus said earlier there's more to your soul than this there's more to your body than this because your soul can be condemned to hell if you have not put your faith and changed your life and turned to the lord and lived based on what he wants you to live your body will burn in hell if you have not put your faith in the lord and turned your life around and lived the way he wants you to live and most of us would stop here but you see the next few verses is a continuation of this He says in verse 35 to verse 40 He speaks about the faithful servant and the evil servant. He says let let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. Wait for your master. How do you wait for your master? Let your waist be girded and let your lamps be burning. And you yourself Verse 36 be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding that when he comes and knocks they may open to him immediately ready for action ready for any work that's the picture that you get when you look at a servant whose waist is girded and lamps are burning ready for action ready for any work the lamps burning the lamps are burning which means that it's the it's the dead of the night but the servant is not sleeping the servant is awake are you a servant that is awake because all of us as christians are servants of the lord are you a servant that is awake is your lamp burning or have you gone to sleep my dear brother my dear sister do you have your waist girded are you ready to start the work that the lord wants you to do to do Are you ready to listen to his next command and do what he wants you to do or are you sleeping? Verse 37 says blessed are those servants whom the master when he comes will find watching. Assuredly I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. The master will come and serve them. 
And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. My dear brother, my dear sister, Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back soon. Are you ready to meet your God? Are you ready to meet your maker? Or are you lost? Are you sleeping? Are you sleeping in all the, the work and the career that you're following? Are you sleeping in all the affections of your heart? Are you sleeping and lost in all the wants and desires of your flesh and your soul? Because the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, is coming. And just like a thief does not announce before he comes, the Lord will just come and you will not even know it. Change your life today. Turn. Turn from your ways, my dear brother, my dear sister. Stop being anxious. And the only remedy, the only remedy to avoid anxiety, the only remedy about getting rid of anxiety is two things. First, Sell your possessions. Give the things that you have hoarded, the storehouses of your treasure. Give it. Give it to the poor. Give alms. Give it out. And let, you not, let not your treasure be the treasure of this world. But let your focus and the passion of your heart be towards the kingdom of God. And second, be a servant of God that is having his waist girded and his lamps burning, awake, watching, ready for the next command and waiting for his master. These are the two things that are the remedy for anxiety. If you're worried, if you're anxious, make sure you have these two things in your life. Turn your life, my dear brother, my dear sister. Turn your life from the anxieties and affections and passions of this world. I want to say a prayer for you. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this brother and for this sister. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in their lives, Lord. We ask you, Lord, that you remove, Lord, every worry and every anxiety, Lord. Lord, let them encounter you personally, Lord. Let them encounter you in their lives, Lord. Let them know that you are God and that you are the living God, Lord. And in the name of Jesus and by the power of his most precious blood, every spirit of anxiety, every spirit of fear, every spirit of terror, every spirit of worry, in the name of Jesus, I command you, leave this brother, leave this sister in Jesus' name. Leave this brother and sister in Jesus' name. Every spirit of anxiety, anxious thoughts, cyclic thoughts, leave in the name of Jesus. You have no power over this brother, over the sister. There is no power that you have. The word of God says that we have been given authority over serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy. In the name of Jesus, go. Go and never return again. Leave this brother, leave this sister. May the yoke of anxiety be broken over their lives. May it be broken. Long have you held this brother and this sister hostage. Be gone in Jesus' name. And Lord, we ask you that you bless them. Bless this brother, bless this sister, Lord. Fill them with your strength and with your grace, Lord. Let them know that you are their God, that you are Jehovah Jireh, their provider. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My dear brother, my dear sister, may God bless you. Remember, the master is coming. Stay awake. God bless you.